scriptures in hand and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 20 through 23. We're continuing our vision series this year, City Changers. And this morning's message is titled, Partners with God. Partners with God. You know, in 1989, a day etched in history, the world watched as the Berlin Wall came down, liberating East Germany from decades of communist rule. And the clips that we saw on TV were President Reagan adamantly declaring, Mr. Gorbachev, bring down the wall. And there's no doubt President Reagan played a pivotal role in what he was doing uh, behind the scenes as well. But what was not shown on TV was the fact that in 1982, a local pastor in the city of Leipzig, East Germany, started a prayer meeting to pray for that very thing to pray for peace in the area, to pray for the coming down of the wall and the removal of the communist regime. And they met every week despite pressure from the East German communist government that discouraged participation in religious activities. Initially, when they started the prayer meeting, it was only a handful of people. That was in 1982, but by 1989, the number was in the tens of thousands. Initially, the government ignored the prayer meeting but as the numbers grew, the pastor and his followers were beaten, arrested, threatened, and pressure was placed on them to stop the prayer meetings, but they remained resolute. In May of that year, military troops filled Leipzig. The police blockaded the streets around the church to try to keep the people out, and the communist government ordered the church to be shut down. In uh, the BBC, the British Broadcasting uh, Company, a secular news source, reported, ignoring death threats, the huge banks of armed police, thousands gathered at St. Nicholas Church in East Germany city of Leipzig on the 9th of October 1989 to pray. On that day, 8,000 crowded in the church to pray and some 70,000 gathered in the streets. After prayer, they marched against the country's communist regime. The, the, uh, the uh, BBC continued, it was the largest impromptu demonstration ever witnessed in East Germany, but this was no spontaneous flash mob. The reporter said it was the culmination. Remember, this is a secular news source. And they said it was the culmination of years of weekly prayer meetings organized by Christian Führer, the pastor of St. Nicholas. The BBC report identified the church as playing a prominent role in bringing down the communist regime in East Germany. A quote said, East German officials would later say they were ready for anything except for candles and prayer. They were ready for anything except for candles and prayer. The article concluded saying, After the fall of the Berlin Wall, St. Nicholas went back to being a normal parish church. But Pastor Fuhrer said their actions had not been about boosting attendance figures in their congregation. He said, quote, We did it because the church has to do it. We did it because the church has to do it. Folks, here was this little church in a sleepy city in, in East Germany that changed the world. They changed their city. They changed their country. They changed much of Europe because they understood that they were not just called to come to church, but they were called to have a role for the kingdom of God beyond just attending church. This is a truth that every single one of us must grasp today. Read with me, if you will, Ephesians 1, 20 through 20. All this energy, some versions say power, all this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from the dead and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe. Everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power exempt from his rule and not just for the time being but forever. He is in charge of it all, has the final word on everything. At the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The world is not central. 
and the church is somewhere on the outskirts. The church is central and the world is on the periphery. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts by which he fills everything with his presence. Hallelujah. We need to grasp the truth that being a Christian is about much more than just having our sins forgiven and a guarantee of going to heaven. Being a Christian is about more than just showing up on Sunday morning and attending church. This passage reveals to us that the church, that's us. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's us. That's you and me. Say it. The church plays a crucial role. In God's plan of bringing all things under the rule of Christ. Under the kingdom of Christ. And we need to understand that we are a part. A partner with God. In bringing all things under the rule of Christ. You see we need to understand that Christ rules over the church. But his rule extends over all. Christ rules over the church, but that's not all he rules over. We have this mentality that relegates Christ to Sundays and, and, and the spiritual aspects of our life. But, he, but then we have this mindset that he has no connection to everything else. The church has been pushed to the periphery of society. And yes, we do live in Babylon. We've been talking about that. Just like when the Israelites were taken into exile in Babylon, a pagan uh, regime, a pagan uh, nation, a pagan empire, godless, worshiping all of these idols and, 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 and steeped in immorality and idolatry. We are living in Babylon, a godless society. A society that is hostile to Christianity. But the church has played a role in our own loss of influence. In that we have disengaged from society. And we have relegated Christianity to a Sunday morning activity within the walls of the church. That we just simply add to our life. We, we, we um, treat our Christian faith as an addendum to our life. It's an add-on. Rather than being the center of our life and everything else on the periphery. But Christ rules over all things. And that means that Christ must rule over every area of our life. It means that his throne must be central in our life. It means that Christ must be the center of everything in our life. Not an add-on. Even in our schedule. Let me illustrate it with our schedule. We often treat the things of God as an add-on to our schedule if we can fit it in. God, you ought to be grateful that I came to church on Sunday morning because you don't know how busy I am. But don't ask me to do anything beyond that. Because God, my schedule is packed. I think God's pretty busy too. But doesn't he always make himself available when we call on to him? <clears throat> doesn't he always make himself available when we need help, when we need healing, when, when we need his intervention? Amen. When we pray, he never puts us on hold. His secretary never comes online and says, he's, he's too busy right now. He'll have to get back. Aren't you grateful for that? He doesn't put you on hold endlessly. Like when you call up a company and they got you on hold and you hear uh, music for, the, for two hours before somebody talks to you. He's always available to us. Amen. But we treat God as an add-on to our life. Wow. If we can fit you in to our busy schedule, then God, ooh, it's awful quiet in here. Go ahead, Pastor. It real, it but God deserves the central place because you know what? We, we think we're so busy. But we would have no time if God had not given us the time. If God hadn't, this is the day that the Lord has made. If God didn't wake us up to this day, we wouldn't be breathing this morning. We would have no time if it were not God giving us another day. Yes. Amen? And that's why he must be central. He must be central in all that we do. He must be the center 
of our life. Ruling over every area of our life. And it means that ultimately, not only is he to rule over every area of our life, but, but ultimately he is sovereign over all things in this world. All things. There is nothing that is not subject to Christ. In Genesis 1, after the creation of Adam and Eve, the, the, the Lord said that he gave them dominion over the earth. He was delegating authority to them, and the authority that he delegated to them was the authority to administer his kingdom, his rule over his creation, over earth. But in Genesis 3, they willingly relinquished that dominion to Satan, God was supposed to be the center. That's why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life were in the center of the garden, not on the edge, but in the center. Representing that God is supposed to be center in our life, center in everything we do. But you know what? They stepped into the center and ate of the tree. And by stepping into the center, they kicked God out of the center and self took central place at the temptation of Satan. And so by rejecting God's authority that told us not to step into the center, by rejecting God's authority, they by default submitted to Satan's authority. They chose Satan's rule over God's rule. And as a result, the world fell into sin and humankind came under the dominion of darkness and sin. Under the dominion of Satan. So at that point, Satan gained power over the earth. That's why he's referred to as the God of this world or of this age. It doesn't mean that Satan is supreme ruler. God is still on the throne. God is still sovereign. But it does say that Satan is the God of this world describing the dominating influence that he has over this world. Over the values, the thoughts, the ideals, the opinions, the views, the lifestyle of all of those who are without Christ. And we were all in that number at one point. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2. We were all in darkness. We were all under Satan's rule. And Satan is presently the primary influencer. In all dimensions of culture. And, and, and if we really wanted to break it down, culture is comprised of basically seven arenas or seven spheres. Religion. All the religions of the world have been spawned by the deception of the enemy and his influence has infiltrated even the church. So every false religion of this world has been birthed out of darkness and the enemy has even infiltrated the church. If you see the compromise that is taking place in the church with the world today, it is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. You cannot even tell some of the pastors the way that they are tatted up, pierced up, the way that they live. Pastor of a 15,000 person church getting a tattoo of himself on his uh, upper uh, uh, arm and flexing his muscle to show everybody, tell him, don't I look good? The height of egotism. Yes. Entertainment. Go ahead, I is at the center of sin. And whenever attention is called to self, there's something wrong. But as you look around, you see the compromise with the worldliness of the church. Just, just two weeks ago, and, and many denominations have already gone this way. But just two weeks ago, the Methodist church took a vote. Thankfully it failed, but by a mar narrow mar margin, they took a vote to accept or embrace homosexuality. Thankfully it failed wow. by about 50 votes. But it was a very narrow margin. Many denominations have already gone that way. You see, darkness has already infiltrated the church. And then a second sphere of, of culture shapers is the family. 
And certainly we can see the impact of darkness on the family. See, the, the basic building block of society that God created first was the family. Adam and Eve in the garden. The two shall become one flesh. The family was God's basic building block. But just like the Satan infiltrated the first marriage and brought problems, Satan is still attacking family today. Because as the family goes, so goes society. When, when marriages break down, it has a tremendous impact on children. It has a tremendous impact on their lifestyle, on the choices they make, and most often it is a negative impact. And I don't want to get into details with that. But we can see the incredible attack of darkness against family values in society, redefining marriage in society, treating marriage... As if it's nothing, just pay $49 and get a no-fault divorce. We see the breakdown of marriage. First marriages, 50% of them end in divorce. Second marriages, 85% of them end in divorce. And I'm not preaching condemnation against anyone. I am just saying Satan has an all-out attack against families. A third culture shaper is education. And the educational system in the United States was once based on biblical principles. But the Bible and anything Christian is no longer permitted in schools. But Eastern mysticism is. Meditation exercises are that are focused on Eastern mysticism. We see darkness infiltrating with ungodly values. Immoral values now being taught at kindergarten age. Government is a fourth shaper of society and culture. And we don't have to elaborate much in this area. The corruption and immorality in government is very evident to all on both sides of the aisle. Amen? And a nation's moral values are greatly influenced by its leaders. And if our leaders are living immoral lifestyles and our leaders are corrupt, God help our nation. A fifth shaper of society and culture is media. And I don't think much has to be said here either. You just turn your TV on and you will see the filth. And is attacking our sound system this morning as well. Amen. But media, I mean, the entertainment that's out there today, the, 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 the slant of news reporters that's out there today, for the most part is very liberal concerning things of God and, 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 and morality. And that message is constantly, constantly uh, being uh, broadcast. And it infiltrates the minds of people to make ungodly behaviors and lifestyles acceptable. Acceptable. Media. Culture shaper. And then the arts and entertainment. Hollywood wields tremendous power over the views and values of culture through TV, movies, sexual perversion, violence, and vulgarity have become normalized. And then seventhly, business. Money is power in this world. And the ability to create wealth wields tremendous power. And now we have CEOs of large corporations, billionaires, taking stands on certain issues. And using their monies to fund campaigns. Not just political campaigns, but I'm talking about media campaigns. That will promote their particular pet issue. That often reflects ungodly values. Some of them even refusing to do business with people who do not endorse or embrace those values. This is the world in which we live. 
Why? Because Satan is presently the primary influencer in all of those seven areas of culture. But Jesus died to destroy the works of darkness. Jesus died to redeem the world from Satan's power. And the moment we accept Christ, we are transferred from being under Satan's dominion to being in Christ's kingdom or to being under his rule. And we are called to be the light of the world, penetrating the darkness. We are called to be the salt of the earth, preserving the earth from rot and corruption. Just like when you salt meat in order to preserve it, to keep it from rotting. We are the salt of the earth to keep the rot and the corruption of sin from overtaking this world we are to be a restraining force for righteousness and morality we are called to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth we are to be influencers of the kingdom of God shaping the world around us hallelujah God's original intention was for humankind to administer his dominion over the earth to administer his rule his reign over the earth and and through sin Adam and Eve forfeited to Satan but through Christ's redemption we are now called to be the agents of his kingdom we are now called once again to administer his kingdom here on earth about 30 years ago, two widely known Christian leaders, Lauren Cunningham, the founder of Youth with a Mission, and Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, both of which are international ministries that have impacted hundreds of thousands. But both of them simultaneously, unbeknownst to each other, received a spirit-inspired message for one another, identifying those seven spheres that we just talked about as the culture shapers or the mind molders of every generation, of every nation. God's message that they were given to share with each other is that if they could capture those seven strategic areas, they call them mountains. Mountains represent power and strongholds. If they could capture those seven mountains of societal influence, they could reap the harvest of the nations. And still today, that is a message for us. We need spirit-empowered believers to rise up in each of those seven spheres of cultural influence. We need the church to rise up in purity, in righteousness, in holiness, and take a stand in the boldness of the Holy Spirit for what is right. A church that will refuse to compromise and a church that will be prophetic with the word of God and not cater to itching ears, as the Bible says. Too much of the church today is preaching just to what people want to hear a feel good message a motivational message but not a message preparing us for Christ to be his bride without spot nor wrinkle not a message preparing us to be a prophetic people to engage under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and make a difference for the kingdom of God we need the church to rise up we need families to rise up, godly families that will be a model of righteousness, that will be a reflection of the love that God has for his church through Christ, that will be a model of Christian marriage, a light in the darkness. We need educators that will go forth into the public school system and will be a light for the kingdom of God. We need people who will get involved in government. God may call you to be the next presidential candidate. And if you reflect kingdom values, I'll vote for you. We need people to get involved. Get involved locally first and build. But we need people involved in the political arena that will stand for, the, for righteousness and for the values of the kingdom of God. We need people in media, in news, that will stand for the kingdom of God. Maybe God will call you to be a journalist who will represent the values of the kingdom of God. We need people involved in arts and entertainment because so much of those that are inv involved in arts and entertainment today represent 
godless values and immorality. And that's why you're seeing what you're seeing being produced. We need godly people who will become writers and directors and producers and actors and actors that will say as some of them even now and they're ridiculed for it because they take a stand and they'll say, I won't play that part and I won't do it. We need that today. We need Christian people in all these areas. You know, in the area of media, I was watching an interview with Kathy Lee Gifford. She was the former co-host of the Today Show, and she was on the Dr. Oz Show being interviewed about a new book she had written. And, and as a believer, she was speaking about how it was faith in Christ that had helped her through all of the difficulties that she has faced in life, and, and especially one event, which was the loss of her husband. And she shared how she has hope, and no, this is on national television. She shared how she has hope and knows that her husband was, is with Christ because he was a believer. She fielded questions from the audience and every question she responded with scripture and, and, and she would say, I think, and then she would correct herself and she would say, no, I know Amen. Christ is the answer. Amen. They showed a clip from her on the Today Show right after her husband's death and she was testifying of her faith on the Today Show, testifying of her faith and, and, and in sharing her testimony, she all but gave an altar call for people who were hurting to come to Christ. Folks, that's what we need. Right. We need more believers who will stand up with the boldness of the Spirit and will not be afraid to speak for Christ, that they will not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Hallelujah. We need people who will stand for the kingdom of God in all of these areas. In, in arts and entertainment, have you noticed how many Christian films have recently uh, started being produced? It's wonderful. And they're being shown in, in, in the theaters. And, and, and we need more people who will go into this industry. Christian writers, directors, producers, and actors. More believers who will rise up unashamedly in the areas of art and media to share the gospel message. Hallelujah. In the area of business, we have seen people like David Green, a Christian billionaire and founder of Hobby Lobby. I was in Oklahoma City when he started his first store. And before he started that store, he borrowed a few hundred dollars from one of his family members and they started making frames on their dining room table and, and selling those frames. Then he started his first Hobby Lobby store. And then now he is an intern, a, a national, has a national change of stores and he's a multi-billionaire. And, and, and with his impeccable character and practice, he was able to take issues to the Supreme Court regarding the Affordable Care Act that was forcing employers, even Christian employers, to provide abortion coverage for their employees. And standing on the conviction of his faith, he took that all the way to the Supreme Court. And one of the things that caused them to rule in his favor is that they saw that this was not just some, you know, last minute fly by night effort to get out of paying uh, uh, some kind of coverage, but they saw the impeccable character of his life through the years. They saw how he treated his employees, paying them well above uh, the, the minimum wage. They saw how he closed his stores uh, on Sundays and, and Christian Hall. They saw that it was a real lifestyle for him. Right. And as a result, they ruled in favor of not compelling Christian organizations to pay for abortion coverage. He won a great victory for the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because as a Christian, there is no way that we can support abortion. I'm sorry, but if you read the Bible, there's no way you can support abortion. Amen? And that's why I can't support any candidate that supports abortion. But that's another discussion for another time. And, and, and so uh, we need people that will stand up like, like, like David Green. And, and, and this is something that he not only does in the public arena, he gives millions of dollars every year to Assembly of God missions. Every year funding the work of the kingdom of God. We need more believers in business who will live righteously, who will use their influence to shape culture and will use their resources to advance the kingdom of God. We need Christian business people.
We need Bible-believing, spirit-filled believers who are living in righteousness to rise up in the areas of religion, family, politics, media, arts, and entertainment, education, and business, in all seven areas of culture. We need spirit-filled believers who will take a stand for the kingdom of God to extend the influence of Christ's rule in all of these areas. It's time to take Christianity outside of the four walls of the church. Hallelujah! and influence society. That's what God has called us to do. Secondly, God's eternal purpose is to bring all things under the rule of Christ. We need to understand the already and the not yet aspects of the kingdom of God. Through Christ's death and resurrection, Satan was vanquished and redemption was purchased. He defeated Satan. However, still, Satan is the God of this world. Although those who have placed their faith in Christ have been set free from Satan's rule, from Satan's power, and we are now under Christ's rule. But ultimately, Satan's defeat will be manifest when Christ returns. And Satan and his demons will then be bound, and they will be cast into the everlasting lake of fire, and Christ will establish his righteous reign here on earth. But until then, while we're here on earth, Jesus taught us to pray this way. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that's not just some prayer that we pray memorized and we just repeat it. He's giving us principles for prayer. To pray God's kingdom is that we're praying. Heavenly Father, we are praying that you will raise up influencers in government. We are praying, Lord God, that they will be able to stand for issues that reflect your kingdom. Lord, we're praying that you would raise up godly administrators in the education field, godly educators that will influence the direction of education. You see, you, you are applying the precepts of that prayer, thy kingdom come, but you are applying it in your prayers in very specific ways, praying for the rule of God to be extended. Are, are, are you understanding what I'm saying? So we need to pray these realities into being. And Satan's manif uh, defeat will ultimately be manifest when Christ returns. But while we're here on earth, we need to be praying. See, every time Jesus healed the sick, he cast out demons. He said, this means the kingdom of God is here. And every time darkness is brought down, it means the kingdom of God is being made manifest. And this is God's desire for his will to be done, for his kingdom to be made manifest here on earth presently, even as it was through the ministry of Christ. When, when he said, the kingdom of God is here. And you can see it because people are being healed, because people are being delivered, people are being set free, lives are being restored. You can see the presence of the kingdom of God. And every time someone gets saved, you can see that the kingdom of God is here because the powers of darkness are being broken over their lives. Amen? Every time there's a victory for morality, there is a manifestation of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Just as when there are ungodly things, such as the abortion bill in New York, approving, uh, legalizing full-term abortion, that's a manifestation of the kingdom of darkness. But when things like that are reversed or brought down, it is a manifestation of the kingdom of God because we are engaged in a war, the Bible tells us, between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. Something else we need to see is the church is central to everything God is doing in this world. The church is not some peripheral activity that we do on Sunday mornings. It is central to all that God wants to do in this world in asserting the reign of Christ over all areas of society. Could God act independently of us? Yes, God can do anything. But God has chosen the church to be the vehicle of his kingdom in this world. And the church is not an institution or an organization. The church is a people. Yes. The church is you. Yes. The church is me. And God says we are central yes. to his plan yes. in this world. And what does that mean? It means that we need to shift from an inward focus to an outward focus. We need to move from an emphasis of coming to church to going out into the world and being the church. Hello? Yes. 
We need to shift from merely coming to church to be blessed and instead coming to church to be equipped to go out into the world as agents of God's kingdom. We need to understand that when we go to work or, or we go to the store, we are agents of God's kingdom to make God known, to influence and shape the thinking, the values, the views of those around us according to scriptural truth. God wants to shape the culture of our city and of our nation through our lives. One on one through our personal relationships, but also through our involvement in business, media, arts and entertainment, education, politics, family, and religion. And when we grasp that, we will no longer be able to sit on a pew as a passive church attender. When we realize that we are partners with Almighty God in His mission to bring all things under the rule of Christ. We will never be able to be contented with just going to church on Sunday morning. He rules over all things. And in this passage of scripture, He tells us the same power. And he calls it the exceeding greatness of the power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is working in us. Now that's important because when we hear a message like this, we, we say amen, but inside we're feeling, I, I can't do anything. That's great. I think the church ought to be doing this. I think other people ought to be doing this, but I'm just poor little old me. But he says that the same exceeding greatness of the power that raised Jesus back from the dead is working in you. you. Hallelujah. We can be assured that if we will partner with him, if we will partner in his purpose, his power will enable us to do what he's calling us to do and we will be successful at it because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is working in us. Wow. Say the same power power. that raised Jesus from the dead is working in me. me. Say it again. The same power power. that raised Jesus from the dead is working in me. Hallelujah. Now get this. The power that put Jesus on the cross was Satan himself. And Jesus let us know that because he told Judas that Satan had filled his heart. That's what the scripture says. Satan had filled Judas's heart. So we know that the power that was working behind the scenes to crucify Jesus was the powers of darkness. And I'm sure that the moment that Jesus hung on that cross and took his last breath, that all of hell rejoiced because they believed that they had won a victory and put a stop to God's eternal purpose of redemption. But Satan didn't realize that he had played right into God's hand. And on the third day, the earth shook and the stone rolled away and up from the grave, Jesus arose, conquering death, hell, and the grave, taking the keys from Satan. Satan doesn't even have the keys to his own house anymore because Jesus rose from the dead. That was the death blow to Satan's kingdom. Hallelujah. And the same power, the same power that effectuated that death blow to the kingdom of darkness is the same power that is working in us today so that we can be agents of God's kingdom to destroy the works of darkness in this world and extend God's righteous reign. To extend God's righteous reign in our sphere of influence among our family, our friends, our co-workers, uh, our, our field of influence, our, our business, our, 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 our career, that we can be uh, uh, avenues through which God's kingdom is made manifest and is established. A handful of believers, impoverished and oppressed under communist rule, partnered with God 
and the results were beyond anything they could have initially imagined. Bringing about an incredible revolution that broke the iron fist of communism over East Germany and much of Europe. It all started with just a handful of believers. And they probably felt, what difference can we make? We're just a small group of believers. But the same power that raised Jesus from the dead was working in them. And it resulted in a move that brought down the wall uh, uh, that divided East Germany from West Germany that represented the, the fist of communist rule. It changed Germany. It changed Europe. It changed the world. And all because a group of believers started to pray and realized that God wanted to use them to make a difference in the world. Folks, God wants to use you. He wants to use me to engage the world to change the world for him and if we'll partner with him and start right here where we are they started right where they were in their home church if we'll start right where we are that same power that raised Jesus from the dead can and will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine where do we start we can start with something as simple as the 30, 60, 90 campaign that we're involved in right now. Praying for three people. This month, reaching out to them in the love of Christ, doing something tangible to show them the love of Christ. Next month, inviting them to church and, uh, if possible, sharing a testimony of faith with them, bringing them to church with us. That can make a difference if each one of us reaches three people. Something else we're going to be asking you to engage in in April since Easter is the number one time of the year when people are open to coming to church. We're going to have Easter invite cards for you. And we're going to ask every person to adopt your block. So it, it could, if you're in, in a single family home, it's your block. If you're in an apartment building, maybe it's your floor. And, and we're going to have packets of 30 cards. You can take more if you want, but we're going to have packets of 30 invite cards and we're just going to ask you to go along your neighborhood if you see your neighbors out invite them if you know them knock on their door invite them if not you can just put it in the slit of their door or you can hang it as a canopy over the little red flag on their mailbox if you're in a single family uh, uh, um, community don't put it in their mailbox as a federal crime amen but you can hang it over the little red flag uh, and, and they'll see it when they come home to get their mail but just if every one of us commits to 30 homes, we can make a difference. Amen? Amen? So we can start small. They started small in Leipzig, Germany. Just a handful of believers in a local church. But they had such an impact over the years that they changed their nation. They changed Europe. And they changed the world. And the same spirit that enabled them to do that is the same spirit that is working in us. So let us commit to partner with God and be agents of his kingdom in our work, in our neighborhoods, among our family, and among our friends. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now, Lord God. And Lord, what a privilege it is for us that you have chosen us to partner together with you in establishing your kingdom reign, extending your kingdom reign in this world. Father, I pray that every one of us would be stirred by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning so that none of us can any longer be content just to come to church because you didn't save us to come to church, Lord God. You saved us and called us to make a difference for you in this world. And I pray that every single one of us would answer that call this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we can partner with God to be an agent of his kingdom, we first have to have a relationship with him. And the only way that we can have a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. Because we have all sinned. And our sin is like a wall that separates us from God. And as long as we're in our sin, we are spiritually dead, spiritually cut off from God. That's what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2. We were all dead in our trespasses and sins, spiritually cut off from God. But that's the whole reason Jesus came and died and gave his life on the cross as a payment for our sins. 
He took the punishment we deserved. And so now, when we place our faith in Him, and we repent of our sins, and we invite Him to come and be the Lord of our life and take control, in that moment, we are made spiritually alive. Jesus called it being born again. That is the beginning of a wonderful, lifelong spiritual journey in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And when we get saved, God then has a purpose, a plan, and a calling for each one of us. But it all starts with receiving Jesus as our Savior. And if there's anyone here today, you may have heard about Jesus before in your mind. You might even have agreed what you heard was true. But if you personally have not resp responded and received Jesus as your Savior in faith, then all that he has done for us in dying on the cross and rising again from the dead, it's of no benefit for you. But he loves you. You're not here by accident. He stands with his arms outstretched towards you, calling you to himself because he wants a relationship with you. And if you would say this morning, pray for me, Pastor. I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to have a relationship with God. Or maybe you accepted him some time ago and you've drifted away and you know you need to come back. If that's you, you can raise your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor. I want to come back to Jesus. So if you fit either of those categories, and you would say, pray for me, Pastor. I want to come to Jesus or I want to come back to Jesus. Would you just slip your hand up and you can put it right back down.